On a dark, chilling night in March 2017, precisely at 9.07 p.m., a young man dressed in black walked into the Thessaloniki Grill in Hern, Germany. He approached the counter and with an almost inaudible whisper uttered, I am Marcel. The perplexed employee questioned, which Marcel is this then? Look at your tablet, the young man commanded, his voice barely a murmur. You will see a picture of me there. As the employee's eyes darted to the screen, the horrifying truth revealed itself. Marcel was the notorious headline of Germany, a merciless killer, on the run for four harrowing days. With an eerie calmness, the young man spoke. Call the police. I'm wanted. Before we start, if you find this video fascinating, then at the end, please drop it a like and let me know what you thought about the case. It helps the channel. Also, don't forget to hit subscribe for more. Thank you. In the north of Germany, a sinister teenager committed a brutal pair of murders. He posted chilling images and videos of the crimes to social media and the dark web. Marcel Hess, a 19-year-old devoid of warmth and remorse, has been branded the WhatsApp killer by authorities. Hess, a martial arts enthusiast residing with his parents, was unemployed and socially reclusive. After being deemed unstable and rejected by the German army, his descent into darkness accelerated. His sister recounted their once normal relationship until primary school, when he, quote, became strange and sought refuge in the digital world due to his lack of friends. She revealed his violent tendencies emerged early on, recalling how he attacked a teacher with a pair of scissors and chased his brother through their home with a knife. The heinous acts started when he was chatting to a friend online. He was talking about causing damage to himself. The chat says, soon all preparations are done, can barely walk straight after all the red wine. If I can't pull it off today, I'll do something jail worthy. He then said, want 4chan worthy pictures later? To which his friend replied, of course. His friend then asks him, why are you doing this? He replied with this. Kein Bock mehr, ich will nicht arbeiten, deswegen ist natürlich der einzige Grund. Ja, ich müsste bald Bewerbung schreiben, aber na. This roughly translates to, I don't want to work anymore. I don't want to work. That's the only reason. I should write more applications, but meh. The conversation came to an abrupt halt and fate took a grim turn as Hess made the fateful decision to commit a heinous act worthy of imprisonment. For years, Hess had resided with his parents, but since the beginning of that year, he had been living alone with his sister, Sandra, after their parents had moved out. On that fateful Monday evening at 6 p.m., he ventured to his neighbor's house. The family, comprised of mother Janet F, stepfather Pascal R, and three brothers, Maurice, Stephen, and the youngest, Jaden. The parents were out shopping, leaving the three siblings at home. Hess rang the doorbell and asked Jaden if he could assist him in setting up a pair of ladders. The unsuspecting nine-year-old agreed. As his brothers watched him leave, Jaden accompanied Hess to his house. Once there, Hess deviously lured the innocent boy into the darkness of his basement, where he stabbed Jaden 58 times, and allegedly he filmed it and uploaded it onto the dark web on a site called Deeper Cuts. Within hours of committing the heinous act, 
Hess coldly resumed his conversation with his friend, sending a series of gruesome photos of the victim's lifeless body and the crime scene, including one where he had just cleansed the murder weapon. His chilling voice messages continued. They said, I can't seem to get the rope to work, but I just killed the neighbor, so it doesn't feel special now. My hand is bleeding, and that's the only thing that's bothering me. Just cleaned up the blood. One of my shoes is stained, but it's fine. I think I'll turn myself in after a few days and enjoy the jail life. Maybe I'll invite another neighbor over and do the same thing. I'd have two murders to my name then. I'd like to get a girl over so I can force myself on her. By the way, Jaden's insides feel really weird. I can pull them out of him. Ugh. God. He concluded the chilling exchanged with a text message. It read, It was really easy. I could turn one murder into two. His final words were, Read the news tomorrow. Once you get past the mental barrier, it's really easy. Two hours later, Jaden's unsuspecting parents returned home and their worst nightmare began when they realized that their young son had not come back. I went over and banged and yelled, but no one answered, the distraught stepfather Pascal recalled. Something bad has happened, the mother Janet remembered, telling her husband at that dreadful moment. In desperation, Pascal and his stepsons clambered over a balcony wall to enter the basement of the house where they discovered Jaden's lifeless body. I wanted to give him a heart massage, but the blood was streaming from his wounds. The image of my stepson lying there, dead. I will never forget this, said the heartbroken Pascal, as he recounted the horrifying scene from that fateful Monday evening. I found him lying in a giant lake of his own blood, riddled with countless stab wounds, he said. In a state of shock and despair, Pascal and Janet promptly alerted the police, who arrived at the gruesome crime scene. Simultaneously, a disturbed Darknet user, claiming to be acquainted with the killer, after witnessing the horrifying images of the young boy on their chat, they told the police, I have just seen a boy murdered on the internet. Thus began an all-out manhunt for Hess. The authorities pulled out all the stops, deploying helicopters, canine units, and numerous officers in an unprecedented move that defied Germany's strict privacy laws. They even publicized Hess's full name and image in the media. Typically, only the first name and the initial of the second name are disclosed, but the urgency to apprehend Hess overrode these conventions. They were determined to bring him into custody immediately. On the very day that the manhunt commenced, Hess paid a visit to his friend, Christopher W., who resided in the same town. They spent their time playing computer games, eating pizza, and eventually falling asleep. The following day, Hess took to 4chan, posting a photo of a bloodied boot on a bloodstained floor beside a blade. The caption read, I skip state, killed an adult woman, really hard to use XP. Her daughter will come home soon, might actually make a vid soon. He continued, I cut my hand fighting a 120 kilogram beast, had more vigor than the kid, cold, died at 8 a.m., did pick at 1 p.m., finally set up her crappy PC good enough to run. I tortured the credentials out of her, have access to bank, PC and phone, so cannot drop the name yet. One skeptical user challenged him, demanding, timestamp with corpse or BS. Hess responded by posting a photo of the lifeless body accompanied by a timestamp. However, it was later revealed that the victim was not a woman, but Christopher W whom Hess had slain after his friend recognized him on TV as the suspect in the boy's murder. 
Hess feared that Christopher might alert the authorities and expose his whereabouts. Hess stabbed him 68 times and is said to have rammed the pen into the back of his neck. For two days, Hess remained in the flat alone with Christopher's lifeless body. During this time, he made a final post on 4chan, ominously stating, may get caught soon. He also shared a link to a manifesto. This is segments from the manifesto. To kill someone is just a series of movements. To produce the wound, to keep the victim from defending, to give the mortal blow and wait for the victim to be dazed. Hess also provided a motive for his heinous actions, stating, There is a motive, which I've stated, but neither will you press release it, nor probably accept it, since such a meek cause doesn't warrant my actions. Well, it was effective. I got what I wanted. I will not need to contribute to society via becoming an upstanding citizen. Economies work mostly by forced altruism, and I have zero interest in taking part in sustaining something so useless. The following day, Hess decided to turn himself in. It was then that he walked into the Thessaloniki grill and instructed the staff to call the police. A mere 150 meters away, a flat was engulfed in flames, and within it, another body was discovered. Once in custody, Hess confessed to setting the fire in the flat. It was Christopher W's. In the western Germany city of Bochum, the court found 20-year-old Marcel Hess guilty of the murders of his neighbor Jaden and that of Christopher W in the town of Hearn. Hess was sentenced by the court to life in prison with a conditional preventive detention. In Germany, a sentence without such a preventive detention typically results in automatic release after serving 15 years. The court's ruling aligned with the demands of the public prosecutor's office, citing the extreme brutality of the murders as justification for the severe punishment. Hess entered the courtroom dressed entirely in black and wearing handcuffs which were later removed by an officer. The court deliberated whether Hess should be tried as an adult or under juvenile criminal law, which is common in Germany for those under 21. After hearing the testimony of forensic psychologist, Dr. Sabine Nawara, the court decided to sentence Hess according to adult law. Nawara argued that Hess, at the time of the crime, was not the same as a teenager. Despite his youthful appearance, she said his personality was well developed, and she noted the psychopathic, narcissistic, and sadistic elements in his behavior, which made the trial under juvenile law inappropriate. A prison doctor who examined Hess shortly after his detainment described him as a monster and even likened him to Hannibal Lecter. They detailed Hess's peculiar habits in prison. They said, Hess is almost exclusively found standing next to the fence with his eyes closed, when prisoners are allowed out of their cells for a short break. The doctor continued, he is very meticulous, which shows itself during meal time. He puts butter on six pieces of bread, cuts off the bread crust and places it accurately on the edge of the plate. Hess's sister, Sandy, testified that her brother was proud of his actions. And when she asked him during a jail visit if he regretted his crimes, he coldly responded, no. As the courtroom doors closed, the haunting echo of Marcel Hesse's cold, unrepentant response reverberated through the minds of those who bore to witness the chilling trial. The dark shadow of his heinous crimes would linger over the town of Hearn, where innocence was shattered and lives were forever changed. The cold-hearted killer, now confined to the sterile walls of his cell, seemed indifferent to the devastation he had caused. 
that's the end of this episode. Until next time, stay sane. On the 20th of January, 2009, Ekaterina Zinoveya returns home from work to see her housemate, Maxim Golovastik, and his friend, Yuri Mozanov, hung over watching TV. They were eating a stew made with meat, onions, and potatoes. They offered Katerina some, and she sat eating the stew, blissfully unaware that the night before, the two men had killed and dismembered a young woman in the house, and the stew she was eating was made with the flesh of the victim. Before we start, if you find this video fascinating, then at the end, please drop it a like and let me know what you thought about the case. It helps the channel. Also, don't forget to hit subscribe for more and hit the bell notification. Thank you. Karina Budachan, a young woman raised by a single mother, had always harbored a deep passion for the performing arts and she worked tirelessly to attend a theatre school and perform in various productions. She also had an interest in writing, pouring her heart into poetry and short stories. She confided in her friends of her desire to attend a renowned theatre school in Russia and make her way to the United States with the goal of becoming an actress. With her love of the arts, it comes as no surprise to learn that she was also heavily into music, specifically heavy rock music. As she delved further into this world and attended more gigs, at the age of 15, she met a young man named Maxim, who was 19. Maxim became a big influence on Karina, and she began to dress like him listened to the same music and secretly began to fall in love with him. However, at the time they met, Maxim had a girlfriend and he did not reciprocate Karina's feelings of love. They remained friends and continued to attend concerts together. Karina's mother, Nadia, had met Maxim during this time and she said, Karina told me about him. I tried to warn her off because he seemed to play with her emotions. He was too old for her and he gave me the creeps. Life was good for Karina. She had hope for the future. She was discovering the world and she was making new friends until the 19th of January, 2009. The day of her disappearance, Karina had a typical school day. She attended her classes and afterwards, she went to a friend's house to study. As the night grew darker, Karina called her mother and asked about spending the night at her friend's to finish their homework. Little did her mother know that it would be the last time that she would ever hear her daughter's voice. Her mother gave her permission to stay, but told her to be back home for 7 a.m. Karina promised to be back, but she would never make it home again. Karina's mother, Nadia, is worried when she wakes up to find her daughter is not home. She calls her mobile, but no one answers. So she calls Karina's friend to find out where she is. The friend reveals that Karina had gone to meet someone after they had finished their homework and that she had last seen her at the train station. Karina's mother immediately goes to the police station to report her daughter missing and they begin to search right away as she is only 16 years of age. For two long weeks, they look for her everywhere in the city, posting pictures and asking people if they have seen her. Desperate for answers, Karina's mother delved into her daughter's private diary and found dark, passionate love poems addressed to a man named Max. With a sense of impending doom, Nadia urged the authorities to question this Max in connection with Karina's disappearance. But unfortunately, this was not investigated at the time. The news reported on a grisly discovery. The remains of a girl were found discarded in a garbage dump. Her identity unknown. 
But as the forensic team delved deeper, the horrifying truth emerged. It was Karina. The once bright young girl had been brutally dismembered and her body discarded like trash. The cause of death, determined to be drowning, was only the beginning of the nightmare. The precise cuts on her body were made with a practiced hand and suggested the killer must have some expertise, possibly a butcher. The exact date of her death remained a mystery, but one thing was clear. This was a crime of horrific brutality. The investigation continued, but the question remained, who could have committed such a heinous act? The police, then out of nowhere, got a break. A young woman called Katerina Zinovea said that Karina had been round her house the night of the disappearance. Her testimony to the police was like the missing puzzle piece they had been searching for. As she recounted the events, the officers listened intently, hanging on her every word. She said there had been a small house party with a few friends. Her housemate Maxim and his friend Yuri was there. There were also two other people at the party. They had been drinking for some time and were all intoxicated. At some stage, Maxim phones Karina and asks her to join the party. Once the call had ended, he turned and shouted across the room to Yuri and said, the meat is coming. Nobody in the room really understood the darkness of what Maxim had just said, apart from Yuri. Eventually, Karina had joined them, full of laughter and a carefree spirit. The six of them had a great evening, drinking and listening to music. Eventually, Maxim announced that he wants to be alone with Karina, and he asks his friends to leave. He also asks his roommate, Katrina, to give them some space. So all of the guests leave, apart from Yuri. Maxim told Karina that he wanted to be intimate with her and asked her to take a bath with him. She did. Katrina, the housemate, said, Karina was in love with Maxim and went to the bathroom with him. I went to bed. I was sleepy, but heard splashes of water and some noise. I decided to check out what was going on. Yuri stopped me and told me to go back to bed. They had joked earlier that they could kill Karina, but, of course, I couldn't believe for a second that they were serious. The cold calculation of the murder was evident, as Karina lay unaware in the bathtub, with Maxim sitting upon her legs. The facade of normality was shattered as Maxim sneezed three times. A prearranged signal for Yuri to enter and brutally force Karina's head beneath the water. Both men conspiring to take her life. The act was nothing short of heinous, leaving a chilling reminder of the darkness that can reside within the hearts of humans. They meticulously harvested her organs. Her body parts, still warm with the remnants of life, were carefully portioned and prepared for their meal. Vegetables and potatoes were added to the mix. And as they cooked, Yuri and Maxim, with cold precision, cleaned every last trace of their heinous act from the bathroom. For if anyone were to ask, especially the unsuspecting roommate, they would simply say that Karina had left the house, just like all the others before her. But she would never leave. Not truly. For her remains, the ones they didn't cook, were neatly stored away in the freezer, and the evil duo put the rest of Karina's dismembered body, including her severed head, in plastic bags, which they dumped in a district in St. Petersburg. The investigation into the gruesome murder of Karina was relentless, with Yuri and Maxine as prime suspects. But as they sat across from the interrogators, their story twisted and turned, each trying to pin the blame on the other. But their lives could not hold up forever, and they both soon confessed to the heinous act they had committed. 
and when asked why they did this, Maxim coldly responded that they were hungry and that there was no food in the house. It's shocking to hear their utter lack of humanity. Investigators believe that the crime had been planned for some time, and when they found some of Karina's organs in Maxim's refrigerator, they knew they had the killers. To add to this, Maxim also worked as a market stall butcher to answer how the body had been mutilated in such a manner. The callousness with which they took a life for nothing more than a meal is truly terrifying. In addition to the murder, Maxim and Yuri were accused of stealing Karina's property. A camera, a mobile phone, an MP3 player with headphones, and two chains. During the trial, prosecutor Andrei Lavrenko said they cut up the body of the victim into several pieces, eating some of them and throwing the others into the bin. They cooked her meat and served up the meal with potatoes. The arrestees said they ate the girl's body parts because they were hungry. They even served up Karina to their unknowing housemate. At the end of the trial, Yuri took the last word and told the jury that he was a positive and kind person. In addition, the cannibal asked for leniency on his sentence for a chance to save his soul. Maxim refused the last word, saying he was not ready. Shockingly, Nadia, Karina's mother, only found out of the grisly way her daughter had been killed and eaten by watching a TV news report. She said, I collapsed and thought my heart was going to explode. What they did was barbaric. She said to the killers, at the end of the trial, you will burn in hell. Nadia continued, they were oblivious to the pain they caused. When they murdered Karina, they killed my hopes for the future. Now I cling on to an image of her laughing and joking. They were so calm and matter of fact as they told how they killed and cooked her. I still don't understand why they did it. I brought her up to be trusting, but I was wrong. Life is empty without her, and the pain of letting her down will never leave me. Maxim and Yuri were found guilty of murder, and jailed for 19 and 18 years respectively. They were both sentenced to serve their time in a place called the Colony, which is known to be a particularly brutal place to be an inmate. They have strict rules and run a regime dictated by labor and fitness. Regular beatings for inmates are also common. In March 2017, it was announced that Maxim had been found hanging in his cell, eight years into his sentence. He had left a note which read, I have finished my life in this body. The time has come to go away in order to be reborn as a new person. Sources close to Maxim's family claim he never spoke of committing such an act, and he also did not complain about the colony staff or beatings. Quite the opposite, he believed in himself and that he would soon be free. He was waiting for the decision on a review of his case. Maxim, until the end, claimed that he had nothing to do with the murder of Karina, and even more so, did not consider himself a cannibal. That's all we got time for in this episode. Until next time, stay sane. It was February 23rd, 2009. A snowboarder whispered in disbelief, Oh my God, this is a human leg. Both he and his friend had set out for an adrenaline fueled adventure on the Soldaskia mountain near Brask. The area was a haven for thrill seekers. Towering peaks, treacherous turns weaving between the pines, vast blankets of snow and the absence of human interference. It was a deserted military base and the place had an eerie silence and most people chose to avoid going there because it was so desolate. 
it was this very seclusion that would play into the sinister plans of the killers. They had wagered that the body would remain hidden and undiscovered in this desolate frozen landscape. But now, the truth of the horrific events would come to life, and it is brutal. Before we start, if you find this video fascinating, then at the end, please drop it a like and let me know what you thought about the case. It helps the channel. Also, don't forget to hit subscribe for more. Thank you. A group of young individuals found solace in the abandoned structure of the Palace of Pioneers, situated in Brask. Initially designed for the Soviet era as a hub for teenage leisure and activities, but the project was abandoned before it ever opened its doors. However, the more rebellious local youth took over and it became a place for them all to congregate. It was affectionately called Eden and police would routinely chase the youths out of the building. It was within these forsaken walls that a sinister alliance was formed. The eclectic group of young individuals ranged in age from 14 to 20 years old. They would create personas with each other, and although some may know each other's first names, these were never used. Instead, they identified one another by their nicknames, such as Demon, Castrat, Fish, and Prophet. Despite their varying backgrounds, they shared a single unifying factor. These youths sought to distance themselves from the expectations of their parents, and they wanted to live by their own set of rules, unconstrained by the norms imposed by the adult world. The grisly discovery of an unidentified teenage body on Soldaskaya Mountain caught the attention of the Russian Federation's prosecutor's office. A forensic analysis revealed the harrowing circumstances of her demise. She had died from hyperthermia after being stripped, bound at her hands and feet, soaked in water and buried alive under the snow. The young girl was identified as 15-year-old Nastya, she had considered herself part of the alternative movement formed at the Palace of Pioneers. Nastya was a depressed and withdrawn teenager. She separated herself from the society of adults, as they were not so interested in her or her inner world. Nastya's relatives, although did care for her, she was allowed to do as she pleased. There was not much concern about where she was what she eats, how she studies, or with whom she is friends with. She had been romantically involved with 20-year-old Andrei Orakov, also known as the Prophet, and she had been residing with him in his flat. Nastya felt very much in this world. She felt comfortable, but in her final days before her untimely death, between January 31st and February 4th, Nastya found herself among this group of non-conformists. But this time it was different. This time, she was their prisoner. The build-up to these tragic events centers around Demon, whose real name is Dmitry Leshov, who served as the leader of this youthful group. He worked a day job as a supermarket security guard. He was ambitious and dangerous, and the others in the group feared him. His friend Prophet was his right-hand man, and he helped Demon a lot. Prophet had provided Demon with a place to stay and food to eat, and he was able to do this because he inherited two apartments from his mother and grandmother, and after selling one of them, he was able to live comfortably without working often hosting his friends at his remaining property. Members of the group were frequent visitors to his apartment. Nastya had recently started a relationship with Prophet, but this was cut short when Demon accused her of stealing his bank cards and mobile phone. 
Despite Nastia's vehement denial of any involvement in the disappearance of Demon's belongings, she was forced to leave the apartment and was excluded from the group. The vanishing of Demon's belongings set the stage for the grim fate that befell Nastia. Her kidnapping, torture and eventual murder, Demon decided to take matters into his own hands, choosing his own brand of justice. Nastia, without saying anything to her mother, left the house and Demon was waiting for her at the entrance. He said, you stole my phone and bank cards, you will go with me. He forcefully pulled Nastia by the hair into a waiting taxi, returning her to Prophet's apartment, a place where she had once felt secure. The horrifying sequence of events that played out were not only witnessed but also actively participated in by seven individuals from the group. Nastya was seeing some of them for the first time and others she knew very well, so good that she considered them friends. The sinister demon forced Nastya into a room. Quickly, he incited her former roommate, Nadia Gaponik, nicknamed Catastrophe. She was a difficult teenager in the past with whom her parents could not cope. From the age of 14, she ran away from home and hitchhiked around the cities of Russia. Another girl, called Katya, known as Ice Girl, also did not like her parents and ran away from home. Her parents had not seen her since the end of December 2008. Both Catastrophe and Ice Girl had been traveling Urkust and they returned exactly when the kidnapping had just happened. They were both temporarily residing at Prophet's apartment. Demon said Nastia regarded them as promiscuous women. Believing what Demon had told them, they attacked Nastia with their fists, leaving her bruised under her eye. They then punched the other eye because they wanted to make her bruising symmetrical. After the initial beating, Demon and the two women spoke of what they could do next as punishment. They decided to shave Nastia's head to try and take her dignity away. The group then escorted her outside. Demon planned to conceal the abducted girl in a basement at a house not far away, but they failed to open the hatch. So they then proceeded to visit a friend named Gus whose mother happened to be away. They made cups of tea for one another in the kitchen. Nastia was left sitting on the corridor floor. They provided her with tea as well, but not before spitefully spitting into the cup and putting out their cigarettes in it. Demon and Catastrophe tried to stretch a condom over the girl's head, but it tore, the elastic band tightening around her neck. In the end, they settled for covering her head with a plastic shopping bag. Fear froze in Nastia's eyes. She was speechless. She couldn't even whisper. And she understood her torment was just beginning. Subsequently, the group coerced the girl into using a metal pin, similar to those that fasten railway sleepers together, on herself. Much to their twisted amusement, they observed and laughed while her ex-boyfriend captured the disturbing event on his mobile phone. Catastrophe directed the abuse, earning Demon's praise as a skilled entertainer in such cruel acts. He recalled that when she was his girlfriend, she had never been dull. Catastrophe, being eager to please Demon, aggressively pushed the pin into Nastia's rectum prompting her to finally let out a scream after only shedding quiet tears until that point. Later, the relentless Gus came across a gas canister and together with Demon, they seared Nastia's eyebrows by aiming a blast of flames at her face. Gus would later admit during investigations that he enjoyed it. The group would later return to Prophet's apartment and over the next three days, Nastia was subjected to some of the worst and degrading acts of abuse I have ever covered. 
she was forced upon multiple times, other times with just a broom handle. She was also forced to satisfy all the males in the group. All the appalling events were captured on their mobile phones. Nastya, with her spirit entirely crushed, offered no resistance. Silently, she obeyed every order from her tormentors, even as they grew more sadistic. She ate cigarette butts, licked dirt from the floor, chewed a used condom, consumed unclean water from a basin, ingested urine and semen intended for her. She moved about the apartment on her knees and had clothes pins placed on her lips and eyelids. In spite of her compliance, the girl endured relentless abuse for three days. She faced beatings from steel toe cap boots, fists, barrel lids and sticks. The agony was so unbearable that Nastia frequently lost consciousness. However, even the torture couldn't force her to confess to a theft she hadn't committed. She just cried silently, afraid that if she even uttered a word, her friends would kill her. The allegedly stolen bank cards were soon discovered beneath Demon's possessions in a cupboard. As for the mobile phone, she couldn't have taken it, since she was at home when Demon discovered it missing, after their guests had departed. Nastya was expelled the next morning, following a search of her belongings. Prophet knew this, but chose not to question Demon, whom he was used to following without question. The moment had arrived to determine the girl's future. Her body was battered with bruises, abrasions, burns and wounds after three days of relentless torture. Nastya's situation jeopardized the group's carefree existence. If she were to report them to the authorities, their freedom would surely be lost. Demon's paranoia was already spinning. He believed the girl's mother had already sounded the alarm. Nastya had not spent a night at home for four days. Her mother must have told the police by now. They must be looking for her, he thought. Demon was already under investigation at the time for collaborating with other teenagers in a string of petty thefts. He was also very paranoid about forcing himself on Nastya. He believed he had no choice but to end her life. Demon came up with the plan to kill her on his own. They would take the submissive girl to the mountain, under the cover of darkness, leaving her there, bound, allowing the harsh Siberian cold to finish what they had started. Five years earlier, locals found the bodies of street workers on this mountain. They had been murdered by taxi drivers who were unwilling to pay for their services. Since then, the location had gained a notorious reputation in Brask. Demon asked only those he had complete confidence in, Prophet and Kastrat. The fact that Nastya had been considered Prophet's girlfriend up until recently did not bother Demon. Prophet seemed to have been attached to her, or at least he seemed jealous during some of the attacks. A sickening thought. But Prophet wanted to prove his worth to Demon, to show him he was strong. Another thing that did not deter Demon was that Kastrat was only 15 years old, so young to carry out such an act. But Demon knew he could trust him because Kastrat had forced himself on Nastya and he was terrified of his parents or friends finding out and he was willing to end Nastya's life rather than his secret be exposed. They called a taxi and took Nastya to the mountain. The taxi driver didn't have a problem. A hood was pulled over her head so that her face and bruises could not be seen. In the car, she behaved quietly, like a mouse. She did not ask for help. She was too scared. Once at the destination, Demon said, take off your clothes. To which Nastya replied, just don't, I want to live. 
catching the brutal look off the leader. She obeyed. Crying, she pulled off her boots, then jeans and a jacket. For roughly 20 minutes, the girl trudged through the snow without any clothing or footwear, yet she neither screamed nor cried. Later, Demon recounted that the temperature was extremely low, perhaps below minus 40 degrees. Even with warm boots and gloves, his feet and hands were freezing. As Nastya could no longer walk the final stretch, she was dragged by Prophet and Demon, one holding a leg, the other an arm. When they reached a higher point on the mountain, they placed the girl on the snow. She curled up, pleading, don't, please don't. Demon tied her wrists and ankles and then joined them together. Nastya, still conscious, whispered, please don't kill me. Kastrat passed a bottle that he had been carrying for this very purpose. Demon then opened the bottle and poured two and a half liters of water onto the naked, contorted victim. The intention of this was for her to freeze quickly. However, when they covered her in the snow, she was still alive. Kastrat would later recall, as they moved away, he could hear her quietly repeating her plea, please don't, please. Nastya's body was found almost a month after her death, but no one had reported her missing. An officer working on the case said, the day they found Nastya, I remember well. It was February 23rd. We were told that snowboarders, who were building a track for themselves on the mountain, dug up a corpse, either a child or a young girl. At the first examination, it became clear that she had been killed not so long ago. There was no way to identify the body. No one reported the loss of a similar teenager, and there was no missing streetwalkers confirmed. The mother of Nastia assumed her daughter was staying with her grandmother as normal. Meanwhile, the grandmother believed that the granddaughter had gone back to her mother's house. However, the young girl was actually attending parties with her non-conformist friends. At the age of 14, she started living with Prophet, who would later participate in her tragic demise, motivated by the fear of being perceived as weak. The school also faced criticism for not taking appropriate action in response to the teenager's disappearance. It was revealed that the teacher did contact Nastia's mother and even visited her home, but no one answered the door. Nevertheless, the teachers did not feel it was necessary to be more persistent, even when rumours were already spreading that the student had been forced upon and killed. The group couldn't keep their actions a secret. The girls who witnessed Nastia's torture shared their story with their friends. They were unaware that Demon hadn't taken the girl back to the village like he had claimed, but had instead left her for dead in the snow. Demon himself couldn't help but boast about having a, quote, slave girl living in his apartment, who referred to him as, quote, my master, and kissed his feet. He even displayed a photo on his phone featuring a bald-headed girl with clothespins on her lips. The investigators ordered a comprehensive psychological and psychiatric evaluations for the individuals involved. None of them exhibited intellectual or emotional disorders. All of the young people were found to be mentally sound, fully aware of the true nature of their actions and capable of carrying them out. But how can a group of such young people be so brutal and cruel to one of their own? The individuals involved in the criminal case admitted the truth and gave fairly comprehensive statements during both the initial investigation and the court proceedings. While trying to downplay their own culpability as much as possible, all of them acknowledged the charges against them, except from Demon, 
who only accepted responsibility for the murder. Based on their accounts, they were well aware that their actions were unlawful. Nevertheless, they were captivated by their misdeeds and eventually hoped to cover up these offences. The verdict of the regional court found Dmitry Leshov, demon, guilty of his crimes and was sentenced to 25 years in prison, five of which will be spent in prison and the rest in a strict regime colony. Andrei Orokov, or Prophet, received 16 years in a strict regime colony. Two other people that were involved in the torture, Isla Ribachik and Alexander Koryakin, were sentenced to six and four years each in a colony. Kastrat and Gus got ten and six and a half years in an educational colony due to their age. Nadezda Gaponik, also known as Catastrophe, went on the run and avoided being charged. After a successful escape from Brask, Catastrophe's life was far from easy. For seven years, she was unable to obtain any kind of identification, forcing her to take on the most menial, illegal jobs, resorting to streetwalking to make ends meet. Fate caught up with her when she finally found a respectable job and even met her true love. She was actually caught shoplifting fruit in a supermarket. Security called the police and she claimed to not have any documents and gave a fake name. But her real identity was soon verified through a database. Catastrophe got the maximum of 10 years in a strict colony as she did not directly participate in the murder. However, according to the investigator, there were no signs of remorse in her words or expression. When asked about how she felt about the sentencing, she said, I don't want to go to jail, I'm afraid. The convict said it's better to eat the documents rather than them find out why I'm sitting there. It's going to be hard. I didn't know that she was killed. She left town before with her friend. She was then asked, why did she hide after the murder? Catastrophe replied, demon forced me to do those things. Do you think it's been easy for me all these years? I tried to end things several times. Nastya's sister would later emotionally say after the trial, I am 10 years older than Nastya. I didn't live with mother and Nastya. I moved away. The last time I saw my sister was in the summer of 2008. When I came home to visit, I noticed how much she had changed. I tried to talk with my mother on this topic, with Nastya herself. She just said she was in love, because as we later found out, she abandoned school. The killers must experience everything in their own skin, which Nastya experienced. It's not enough to wish them death. Because of them, I was left alone. My grandmother died a year after the murder of Nastya. She could not survive the grief. And my mother died, 10 months after my grandmother. This has been a truly harrowing case to cover. That's the end of this episode. Until next time, stay sane. The shocking bond of sisterhood was shattered when Elizaveta Dubrineva, 22, turned on her younger sister, Stefania, 17, and took her life in a brutal and senseless act of violence. The close relationship the sisters shared, as portrayed to those around them, only added to the shock and horror of the tragedy. As authorities delve into the circumstances surrounding Stefania's death, those closest to the sisters are left to mourn and confront the idea of a sibling committing such a heinous act. The memory of Stefania's death will forever be a chilling reminder of the evil that can exist even within the tightest of bonds. Before we start, if you find this video fascinating, then at the end, please drop it a like and let me know what you thought about the case. It helps the channel. Also, 
Don't forget to hit subscribe for more. Thank you. For years, Elisavita had fixated on her younger sister's image, desperately trying to mimic Stefania's every move. From her hairstyle choices to her makeup routines, even the colour lipstick she wore, they were very close and very loving. But as Stefania turned 17 and began to bask in the limelight, attracting the attention of men and securing modelling opportunities, Elisavita's admiration devolved into an all-consuming, seething envy. And then, in a moment of utter darkness, she reached a breaking point so heinous it shook the very foundations of their relationship. Stas Betaski, a local celebrity from St. Petersburg, knew Stefania for about two years and said that she was a modest and attractive girl who participated in his shows. The news of her passing left Barteski in shock. Despite whispers about her involvement in the sordid world of adult entertainment and streetwalking, he strongly denied these rumours. Stefania was never involved in it, he said, nor adult entertainment. She simply tried to boost her career in modelling. Stefania captured her final nude picture on the eve of her death. It was captioned with, Happy Defender of the Motherland, a salute to the men she professed to love. Stefania had an older boyfriend called Alexei Fativ, who at the time was 41. They met when he employed her as a model on photo shoots. Both sisters were at his apartment, partying, just the three of them. They were said to be having a great time, but during the evening, they had ran out of alcohol, so Fativ went to the shop to get some more, leaving the sisters alone in the St. Petersburg apartment. Now this is where the gruesome acts begin. What started as a disagreement quickly escalated into a bloodbath, as Elisavita fueled by substances and seething with jealousy, flew into a rage that knew no bounds. With merciless precision, she plunged the knife into her sister's body again and again, leaving 189 wounds on Stefania's head, neck, torso, arms and legs, puncturing her vital organs and cutting off her right ear. Elisavita even gouged her sister's eyeballs out. No one other than the two sisters can truly know why this attack began, but afterwards, Stefania was left to bleed out, her dying breaths echoing through the apartment. Surrounded by the sister, she thought she could trust, but now fighting for her life. All the while, Elisavita is just watching on with a blank expression. The aftermath of the tragedy was almost as chilling as the crime itself. Fativ arrived at home and he was met with the grisly sight of Stefania's mangled remains. As he was taken aback by the horror of which he was witnessing, Elisavita had decided she needed to flee. With quick thinking, Fativ was able to apprehend her before she could escape the bloody scene. I can only imagine what must have been going through his mind during this point. He literally just went to get some wine and returned to this. She was then detained by authorities for the horrific killing, but was sent for compulsory psychiatric treatment, where she spent two years. In 2019, she was deemed fit to stand trial and she was charged with the most heinous of crimes murder with particular cruelty. In the court, Elisavita was an emotionless statue, her movements contained within a glass box, her shackles clinking with each shift. The prosecution spoke of the sisters' relationship and their love captured in photographs, but their words echoed with certainty. There are photographs of both sisters hugging each other, but there is no doubt that the elder sister envied the younger one, prosecutors said. They continued, she scoffed at her sister, causing her to endure excruciating pain because of her dislike. 
gouging out her sister's eyes. Despite the possibility of 25 years in prison, her sentence was ultimately reduced to just 13 years. Some may feel this is a mere fraction of the time she deserved for the brutal murder of her own sister. A video shows the expressionless Elisaveta being handcuffed in a glass court cage before being led away to start her sentence. The tragedy of the sisters echoed with a haunting familiarity for those who are close to them. Their aunt, Ekaterina Dubrineva, has memories. She says sends shivers down her spine. She said it was a shocking tragedy that will never be forgotten. My blood turns to ice. These poor children are not guilty in their gruesome childhood and in all their unhappy life which unfortunately ended for Stefania. Both the sisters had spent time in orphanages as children. Stefania was raised in one, but escaped aged 15 and went on the run for three months. Their mother's response to the crime was to stand by Elisaveta and pointed the finger at Stefania's older boyfriend. Their mother claims Elisaveta's memory, shrouded in darkness for so long, has finally been cleared, revealing the truth behind the actions of Fatih. Elisaveta recounts the story of a twisted love affair between Fatih and Stefania, jealousy fueled by nude photographs she had done in the past, revealing the true nature of his malevolence. And to put it mildly, her mother said, Stefania was not loyal to him. This was to be the final nail in the coffin for their doomed relationship. Despite Elisaveta's allegations, the authorities have stated that Fatih is not a suspect in the case, but rather a witness. Fatih himself has vehemently denied any involvement in Stefania's death, speaking out publicly on a Russian television talk show, which also included the sister's mother. He claims to have stumbled upon Stefania's gruesome, mutilated body after a trip to purchase wine and only detained Elisaveta to prevent her from fleeing before turning her over to the police. On this show, the mother physically attacked Fatih and scratched his face. The question of Elisaveta's reliability as a witness is a complicated one, given the conflicting accounts of those who knew her. While some reports suggested she was prone to erratic behavior and had a history of psychotic treatment, others described her as being calm and collected. This disparity raises questions about her stability, but you can understand a mother standing by her child, no matter what even if her accounts cannot be trusted. But in no way, in my opinion, was Fatih involved in the murder. The sudden and brutal nature of the murder leads one to believe that Stefania and Fatih may not have been aware of the extent of Elisaveta's disturbed state. It is a chilling thought that someone seemingly normal can turn on their own kin in an instant leaving behind a trail of devastation. The bond between sisters is meant to be unbreakable, but in this shocking case, it proved to be the very thing that drove one to commit the ultimate betrayal. This dark chapter in the family's history is a haunting reminder of the evil that can lurk within the shadows of even the closest of relationships. Thank you for watching. Until next time, stay sane. Deep in the heart of every society, there are stories that have been passed down from generation to generation, instilling a sense of fear and dread in the hearts of children. Tales of monsters and creatures, real or imagined, who appear out of nowhere to kidnap and devour the innocent. They have long been used as tools of discipline. But these stories are more than mere legends. They are warnings of the unspeakable horrors that lurk within society, waiting for their next victim. In this case, we are looking at a murderer 
who inflicted pain and terror beyond measure, whose crimes are so vile that there have been attempts to remove all record of him from the internet. Crimes so horrific that officers who worked on the case had psychological issues for years after. This one is brutal. Before we start, if you find this video fascinating, then at the end, please drop it a like and let me know what you thought about the case. It helps the channel. Also, don't forget to hit subscribe for more. Thank you. Born on a desolate farm in the Krasnodar territory on August 17th, 1971. Igor Urtashov's life was plagued with darkness from the very beginning. His parents, both victims of chronic alcoholism, were unable to provide the nurturing environment for the young boy. Even during pregnancy, Igor's mother couldn't resist the urge to indulge in heavy drinking sessions. As a result, the child was born weak and sickly. Igor had a hard and affectionless childhood which was marked by a constant struggle for survival. This was brought on by his parents' addiction. At the tender age of seven, Igor's father abandoned the family, leaving them to fend for themselves. School was not a priority for the young Igor, and he was rarely there. And at age 10, he suffered a catastrophic accident that changed his life forever. He was in a car crash, and the impact caused severe damage to his brain, leaving him with a moderate intellectual disability that doctors claimed would never improve. As he struggled to cope with his newfound condition, Igor's behavior became increasingly erratic and his mother was left no choice but to send him to a boarding school for children with disabilities. Once he was at the school, his mother cut ties with him. She was no longer interested in his well-being. Igor was now alone in the world. The boarding school was a cruel and unforgiving place for Igor. The older, stronger pupils took pleasure in tormenting and brutalizing the vulnerable and defenseless boy. With his frail and slender frame, Igor was no match for his attackers and he endured frequent beatings and relentless bullying. The tormentors cruelly knew no bounds, and they resorted to horrific tactics, like soldering the boy's flesh, causing him lasting pain and trauma. With each passing day, Igor's mind and soul were broken, as the abuse he suffered deepened his already fragile state of mind leaving him trapped in a cycle of pain and fear. Despite graduating from the boarding school and completing a vocational school program in carpentry, Igor's dreams of a better life were quickly shattered. His work as a carpenter was short-lived and he was forced to take up what he considered as menial jobs. He worked as a milker, a cleaner and a cook to make ends meet. Driven by his desires for a better life, he made his way to Moscow, hoping for a fresh start. However, the city's unforgiving nature proved to be too much for the vulnerable and unskilled Igor. He struggled to find work and often went hungry, living on the margins of society, unable to escape the harsh realities of his life. The early 90s, brought a glimmer of hope to Igor's bleak existence. There was a chance encounter with a man in which he had a romance. The man was a conductor and changed everything for him. This newfound acquaintance proposed that Igor leave Moscow and follow him to St. Petersburg, where he arranged for him to work at a dishwasher in the Pegasus Cafe, which was known on the gay scene. But the bond was short-lived and the two soon parted ways. Alone once again, Igor moved to the small village of Metelastroy, near St. Petersburg, in search of a new beginning. 
It didn't take long for Igor to ascend the ranks at the Pegasus Cafe. In just a few months, he was promoted from dishwasher and became a bar waiter. Those who knew him described him as vain, self-centered and a petty man who was always dressed fashionably and was attractive. But despite those good looks and charm, Igor's income was never enough to satisfy his desires. Desperate for more money, he began accepting intimate jobs from wealthy patrons of the cafe, gradually becoming a male escort. His services were in high demand among men who had desires for hard pleasures. To attract clients, Igor transformed himself, bleaching his hair and adopting a fashionable haircut. Although he had hoped for some female clients, this never materialized and his only clientele were men. As his reputation grew, he became increasingly consumed by his dark desires and his once vulnerable psyche was replaced by an insatiable appetite for pleasure. Despite the risks, Igor continued to cater to his clients' twisted fantasies, indulging in ever more perverse acts. He will later claim that he was repeatedly the victim of cruel torture by his clients. However, sources suggest that it was him who derived the pleasure from inflicting pain and torture upon his clients specializing in the most twisted and depraved forms of satisfaction by mutual pleasure. Although escorting brought him a good income, over time, the role-playing games ceased to satisfy the sadistic inclinations of the young man. His true nature was that of a predator. He began to prowl the streets, looking for miners who fit his twisted criteria of apparent weakness, luring them into his clutches with a false promise of affection and protection. According to police officer Andre Kubarev, Igor's choice of victims was driven by a sadistic impulse that was both spontaneous and calculated. He came across a defenseless and vulnerable individual. He had already decided in advance what to do with them. Igor had no qualms about choosing his victim and was only concerned with finding someone who was significantly weaker than him, confident that he could overpower them. In December 1993, in the city of St. Petersburg, an appalling act of violence occurred. While walking in Pine Park, Igor noticed three school children, all aged 11. He waited until he was certain there were no adults nearby and then approached the children with a knife. One of the children fled, leaving two brothers in his clutches. Igor then forced the boys to consume alcohol and then brutally forced himself on them before fleeing the scene. Later, the victims described their attacker as a young man with a slim build, effeminate voice, blonde hair, and between the ages of 20 and 25. Despite a frantic search by police, Igor remained at large, causing fear and outrage throughout the community. After the attack in Pine Park, Igor hid for a month. During the day, he worked as a waiter, and at night he served his customers. But in February 1994, he went on a new crime. That day, Igor had the day off, and he started drinking in the morning. Later that day, on Sadovea Street, the lifeless body of a nine-year-old boy was discovered in the hallway of his apartment building. The forensic report confirmed that the child had been brutally forced upon and subsequently died from asphyxiation. The investigators speculated that the killer had possibly caught the boy in the elevator or on the stairs and after assaulting him, strangled him with his bare hands. The fact that the murder had taken place in the corridors of the child's own home terrified and outraged the neighbors. 
but despite extensive investigations, there were no witnesses to the heinous attack and no suspects were lurking around on the day of the crime. The investigators ran a thorough background check on all registered offenders in the area, but were unable to find any leads that would help them solve the case. Later, Igor would admit that he did not plan to take the boy's life, but he could not control himself due to his severe intoxication. Just three months later, in May 1994, Another unsettling incident occurred in St. Petersburg. This time, a 10-year-old boy was brutally attacked in a building located on Ruiz Avenue. According to the boy's testimony, a man approached him near the stairs and lured him to the attic to see some nesting birds. Once inside, the boy realized that there were no birds up there and Igor strangled him until he was unconscious. Then he forced himself on him. Afterwards, he inserted his fingers into his rectum and then tore out his crotch area with his bare hands. The bleeding boy managed to get down from the attic. Residents of the apartments noticed him and called an ambulance. Doctors saved his life but the attack was so severe that he remained permanently disabled. The suspect's description was similar to that given by the victims of the earlier assault in December 1993 in Pine Park. The disturbing incident left the community in fear, with rumours spreading about a potential killer on the loose. The authorities appealed to the public for any information that could help identify the perpetrator. The calm and serene banks of the Neva River became a site of horror when two young boys aged 11 and 12 were brutally assaulted by Igor. Threatening them with a knife, Igor took the boys to a deserted place between the River Pier and the Volodarsky Bridge, where the assault took place. Again, the attacker matched the description of the previous cases. A young, slim blonde man with a high-pitched voice. All of the assaults had taken place between 12 and 6 p.m. on weekdays, leading investigators to speculate that the attacker was either unemployed or worked during the night. As every victim was male, the authorities scoured several gay nightclubs in search of a suspect with the above characteristics, but the investigation yielded no results. The community was left in fear and despair, with parents fearing for the safety of their children as rumours of a predator on the loose continued to spread. The authorities took to the airwaves, urging the public to exercise caution and be vigilant. However, the residents of St. Petersburg refused to wait for the police to apprehend the culprit and took matters into their own hands. Parents took time off work to escort their children to and from school while also warning them about the dangers of the streets. The entire community was on edge, and a sense of fear and uncertainty gripping the city. Despite increasing pressure and public scrutiny, Igor remained undeterred in his twisted pursuits, continuing to stalk the streets in search of his next victim. The hunt for the predator intensified as the community braced itself for the next attack. They did not have to wait long because in September 1994, Igor had spotted a 16-year-old male walking the street. Igor had noticed that it was harder to find younger victims due to the vigilance of the people of St. Petersburg, so he had to try someone a little older. He began to follow this young man through the streets and into his apartment block. Igor gets into the elevator with him and as soon as the doors shut, the attack began. Igor punched the young man in the face, but to his surprise, the young man was not overawed and he fought back and they wrestled in the elevator 
until it arrived at the floor and the doors opened. When they did, the young man ran out and started banging on the apartment doors, informing everyone that the killer was in the building. Igor was scared and fled quickly, but once he got onto the street, he started to feel excitement by what had just happened. And like the cold-blooded predator that he is, he immediately went looking for his next victim, and he quickly spotted one. He was a nine-year-old boy coming home from school. The boy rang the buzzer of his building, which was unbelievably just over the road from where Igor had just fled from his previous attack. But this didn't bother him. He was in the moment. The boy's mother let him in via intercom and buzzed the door open. But nobody noticed the man who slipped in the door behind him. The same thing as before happened. Igor got in the elevator with the young boy, and as soon as the doors shut, the attack happened. Igor strangled the boy until he passed out, and then he rode the elevator up to the top floor. He then dragged the boy into the utility room where the brutal attack began. Igor inserted his fingers into the boy's rectum, tearing his crotch open and then slowly started to rip out more than 8 meters of intestines. A truly vile act. Satisfied with the horror he had delivered, Igor took the boy's school bag and fled the scene. The mother at this point was looking for her son. She was worried as she had only expected him to be a few minutes. She asked the neighbors if they had seen him and she was getting worked up into a panic. The boy had regained consciousness and mustered all the strength he had and crawled back to his apartment. And when his mother returned, she found him, bloodied and weak on the floor. She was horrified by the state of her boy and phoned an ambulance immediately. His life was hanging by a thread and the medical prognosis was not good. After six hours of surgery, they were able to stabilize him. Despite the severity of his injuries, the young boy had the possibility of being saved through an artificial intestine transplant. The procedure was exclusive to the United States and came at a steep cost. Luckily, the American specialists who would carry out the operation offered their services free of charge. Nonetheless, there were still significant expenses to cover including travel, accommodation in the hospital, medical supplies, and nutrition, totaling approximately half a million dollars. Through the kindness of strangers who learned of the boy's situation, an outstanding amount of money was raised in just 10 days, allowing him, along with his mother and grandmother, to travel to America for the transplant. The medical team, worked tirelessly over six years to save the boy's life, performing about 30 rounds of artificial intestine transplantation. Unfortunately, the boy passed away in the year 2000 before the next procedure could be completed. There was though, some solace from the attack. Igor's fingerprints were discovered at the crime scene and investigators conducted interviews with many potential witnesses. Among them was a young woman who reported seeing the perpetrator that day and noted a distinct scent of the popular Black Dragon Lotion, which was an aftershave in the mid-90s. In addition, a 16-year-old boy who had successfully fought off Igor helped the authorities create a detailed sketch of the suspect. The sketch was then distributed as a flyer throughout St. Petersburg, published in newspapers and regularly shown on national television. Igor himself saw this on the television and realized that he was likely to be caught soon. To avoid arrest, he fled to Murmansk, where he dyed his hair a different color and found refuge with a friend. But this did not last long as his friend soon kicked him out. With nowhere to go, 
he went back to St. Petersburg. At first, he was skeptical, but then he thought that the panic had subsided and he was able to move freely through the city. He was able to survive by spending nights with his clients, sleeping in their homes where they would feed him and give him some money. He did this for a while until one of the men with whom he was staying with noticed a bloody backpack that clearly belonged to a child. Although he did not outright think Igor was the killer on the run that everyone was looking for, he still informed the police of his discovery. In no time at all, Igor was quickly apprehended at the house where the bag was found. At first, the suspect declined to cooperate with the investigators, but as time went on, mounting evidence began to point towards his guilt. A number of victims identified him as their attacker, and he also learned of his fingerprint that was found at the crime scene. Additionally, he was unable to provide an explanation of why there were traces of the victim's blood on his shoes. In some form of effort to trick the police, he stated, I love cats very much. I always had a lot of them. Despite the fact that I was brought up in a boarding school, I am very affectionate. I love and appreciate affection. Although he initially denied involvement, the suspect altered his approach and pretended to be mentally ill. He would cry, often for no discernible reason, to convince investigators of his insanity. In his view, only someone who was not sane could have committed these crimes. Igor requested to be committed to a mental hospital for life and received treatment there. Despite his efforts, Igor was unsuccessful in deceiving the experienced psychiatrists who determined that he was mentally sound. As a result, he was denied entry into the treatment facility. Igor had to wait a long time for his trial as no lawyers wanted to defend him. There was that much disdain for his actions. Whilst in prison, he carried on with his crying and screaming, still trying to convince people of his insanity, but to no avail. Other prisoners had ordered a kill on sight on his head. At this point, he was public enemy number one. When his trial finally did go ahead, it was behind closed doors as parents and general members of the public wanted to lynch him if they could get their hands on him. He was quickly given the death sentence, which was no real surprise, and he was taken to the infamous colony. But over time, there was a moratorium on the death sentence, so in the end, he was not put to death. He was, however, in the colony, which could be argued was worse than death because of its constant torment and harsh conditions for inmates. During his time in the colony, he was tormenting other inmates with his antics. He would laugh hysterically for hours at a time or scream in the same manner. Sometimes he may cry for days as well. If he was not doing this, he could often be found staring at a blank wall. The head of the colony said, when Igor was detained, he was declared sane. But as time passes, everything changes. Sometimes you don't even understand what he is saying. One of the officers also spoke about Igor. He said, since his cynicism and cruelty were beyond the limits, even in comparison with everyone else, sooner or later, this person would have come to understand that it was impossible to leave his victims alive and we would have had a whole chain of corpses and then perhaps they would have become even more terrible. Although this case is absolutely brutal, this could have got even worse. That's the end of this episode. Until next time, stay sane. On February 1st, 2019, in Madrid, Spain,
police entered the house of a missing person, their senses immediately assaulted by the putrid stench of death. As they ventured further inside, the horror of the scene unfolded before them like a nightmare. Alberto, a 26-year-old man, had committed the most heinous of acts, butchering his own mother and using her flesh as a means of sustenance. The remains of the 68-year-old woman were scattered throughout the house, her body dismembered into small, grotesque pieces. And if that wasn't enough, he had also fed her to his pet dog. The officers were left to grapple with the sheer depravity of the situation, unsure if they would ever be able to erase the memory of the unspeakable horrors they had just witnessed. Before we start, if you find this video fascinating, then at the end, please drop it a like and let me know what you thought about the case. It helps the channel. Also, don't forget to hit subscribe for more. Thank you. The victim was 68-year-old Maria Soldad Gomez. The first person who noticed something was amiss was a close friend of Maria's. She hadn't seen her for a month when they used to meet almost every day in one of the neighborhood bars to have beer and eat tapas. But her friend's worst fears were confirmed when she reported her missing to the authorities, knowing deep down that something sinister had occurred to Maria. Maria did not live alone. She shared her home with her 26-year-old son, Alberto Sanchez Gomez. He was once a waiter, but in recent months, he had developed a dangerous and destructive habit of drinking and using substances. As his addiction consumed him, dark and twisted signs began to surface. In the days leading up to the murder, Alberto started posting rap videos on Instagram, in which he chillingly confessed to his vices and even declared, there is no cure to my madness. As the evidence against him mounted, it became clear that the true perpetrator behind Maria's disappearance was none other than her own flesh and blood. The realization that the monster who committed such a heinous crime was someone Maria had trusted and loved only adds to the horror of the situation. The relationship between Maria and Alberto was dysfunctional to say the least. About 15 years before her death, Maria lost her husband, a cabinet maker by profession. She was left alone to take care of their two children. The loss of her husband forever destroyed a family that until then seemed normal. The older brother moved out when he was young and married, leaving just Maria and Alberto. Maria had taken out a restraining order against Alberto because he physically and routinely attacked her. The older brother had tried to mediate between them without success. When neighbors asked about the bruises she sometimes had on her body, she lied and said that she had fallen whilst walking the dog. But the truth was more sinister. Her own son was the one who had been hurting her. Maria would regularly kick Alberto out of the house and he would spend a few days sleeping on friends' sofas. But eventually, he would call and she would always take him in. Despite the abuse, Maria couldn't bring herself to cut ties with her son. Even when she knew the type of person she had raised was capable of attacking her, she couldn't let him go. She told neighbors, he's my son, what do you expect me to do? When the police began investigating the disappearance of Maria, one of the first things they did was knock on the door of the Salamanca apartment, where both Maria and Alberto lived. The authorities asked Alberto where his mother was. Alberto replied, My mother is in here, dead. Me and the dog have been eating her, bit by bit. He let them in. One officer described Alberto as calm. We entered the home to see if she needed help. In the second room, we found human remains, and in the kitchen, a pot containing more, said one of the officers. He was very calm. 
I didn't see any emotion of any kind. He was very calm, very cold. The police were horrified by the scene they found inside the home. And the fact that Alberto could be so unemotional about the brutal murder of his own mother. As the police entered the flat, they were met with a scene straight out of a nightmare. Limbs wrapped in plastic lay scattered throughout various rooms. The stench of death permitting the air. But the horror was far from over. In the fridge, they found body parts, neatly packaged and ready for consumption. In the oven, they discovered more remains, roasted for a meal. Even the dog was not spared, as his mother's remains had been given to him as a gruesome treat. As they ventured deeper into the flat, the officers couldn't help but feel their stomachs turn as they stumbled upon the bedroom. There on the bed lay the head, hands and heart of the victim, the mother of the very person they had come to arrest. Alberto, the alleged perpetrator, stood before them, a cold and unfeeling expression on his face. He offered no explanation, no remorse, for the atrocities he had committed. One officer, unable to bear the sight any longer, ran out of the flat to the street, where he proceeded to wretch, the handiwork of a cannibal too much to bear. As they apprehended Alberto, and transferred him to the police headquarters. The officers couldn't shake off the feeling of disgust and revulsion that had taken hold of them. This was a crime beyond comprehension, an act that defied all logic. The officers knew that they would never be able to unsee the horrors that lay within that flat, and the memory of the stench, the sight and the taste of death would haunt them forever. The confession that Alberto gave was chilling, in its matter-of-factness. He revealed that after a heated argument with his mother, he had approached her from behind and strangled her to death, suffocating her in the process. He then proceeded to move her corpse to the bedroom, where he began the gruesome task of dismembering her body, using a carpenter's saw and kitchen knives. For the next 15 days, Alberto fed on his mother's remains, both himself and his pet dog, keeping the meat fresh in plastic containers and the refrigerator. But as some of the meat spoiled, he was forced to dispose of it in plastic bags in the trash. Some of his mother's intestines were found discarded in this way. As the officers listened to Alberto's confession, they couldn't help but feel a sense of revulsion and disgust. The idea of someone committing such a heinous act, let alone consuming the remains of their own mother, this was beyond comprehension. It was clear that Alberto had lost his humanity, consumed by a dark and twisted urge. Whilst in prison awaiting trial, Alberto was writing to a friend, expressing his remorse, but also trying to explain what happened. He said, whenever I get up and go to bed, I think it's been a nightmare. What's done is done, and I'll be sad all my life. It wasn't me who was acting when all this happened. I am mentally ill, and I hope it will help me in court. I was sick a long time ago, and I took refuge in substances. I had been hearing voices and having hallucinations for a long time. All of this led me to the worst thing that has happened to me in my life. I miss you all a lot, just like my mother. I am not comfortable here. I hope they take me to a psychiatric center after the trial. According to a friend of Alberto, the 26 year old had a history of psychiatric issues and had been admitted to hospitals up to three times. He reportedly suffered from a delusion due to persecution disorder. However, during his fourth admission, the public health department deemed him not to be as severe. The friend, who wishes to remain anonymous, revealed that the trigger for Alberto's descent into madness was a trip to Greece, where he received a scholarship. During this trip, he began to have problems and started consuming substances. It is unclear from the information provided if the psychiatric hospitals and the public health department knew about his history of mental health problems. 
and if they took adequate measures to ensure he received the proper treatment and care, or if the authorities were aware of the situation, and if they could have taken any actions to prevent such a tragic event from happening. But sometimes, there is only so much people can do. His friends said, Alberto's life changed when he went to Greece. Around him, he was no longer the same. From being a flirtatious, normal boy, who liked to party from time to time with his friends. He became an introverted guy, with paranoia in his head. Alberto pleaded in court that he was mentally ill at the time of his mother's murder, claiming that he had received a secret message to kill his mother whilst watching television. He also stated that he did not remember committing the murder. However, the court found him guilty of homicide, and the desecration of a human corpse, dismissing his claims of a psychotic episode. The jury, consisting of six women and three men, handed down a 15 year and five month prison sentence to Alberto. He was ordered to pay compensation of 90,000 euros to his older brother. This ruling came after a two week trial in Madrid it is important to note that a legal conviction does not necessarily mean that the accused does not have mental health issues. It is a complex issue that involves the intersection of legal and mental health systems, and the court may have based their decision on the available evidence and expert testimony. Thank you for watching. Until next time, stay sane. In the Mobile County Jail, a twisted figure sits in a cell, his mind consumed with the memories of the innocent women he has taken. He whispers to himself with a sinister tone in his voice, one, two, three, she was carrying a child, four, but the true number of victims is buried deep in his mind, a dark secret, five, six, seven, he murmurs, his eyes cold and empty. He raises his hand, fingers spread wide, relishing in the memories of the lives he has taken. Let's start with this one, he says, pointing to his index finger. The memory of his first murder still etched in his mind. A reminder of the despicable human being Gerald Patrick Lewis truly is. Before we start, if you find this video fascinating, then at the end, please drop it a like and let me know what you thought about the case. It helps the channel. Also, don't forget to subscribe for more and hit the bell notification. Thank you. Gerald Patrick Lewis was born into a life of turmoil and hardship. Although from a middle-class background, his life was turbulent. His childhood marked by a constant back and forth between Atlanta and Boston, with his parents separated and living in either city. The twisted mind of Lewis was evident from a young age, as he displayed the classic signs of a future serial killer. A desire for setting fires, a history of chronic bedwetting, and a disturbing tendency towards animal torture. His family, remembers all too well the atrocities he committed. At the tender age of four, Lewis was alone playing with matches downstairs whilst his family slept. When screams echoed through the house, it was Lewis who had dropped a match on his own pajamas, setting himself ablaze and leaving scars that would mark him for the rest of his life. But even this traumatic event failed to quell his twisted desires. On another evening, not long after, Lewis was stood in his bedroom, lights off, knife in hand, and pressed it to his stomach. He said, I remember thinking, I could pop this in and out real quick, and I wouldn't even feel it, but I didn't have the guts to do it. As he grew older, Lewis's infatuation with fire only intensified, setting ablaze not just woods, but also apartment complexes, with no fear or remorse. 
the depravity of Lewis knew no bounds, as he not only set fire to structures, but also took pleasure in tormenting and killing innocent animals. He bragged about setting fire to a dog house, trapping the family dog inside, but when it miraculously managed to escape, he found a new way to satisfy his sadistic tendencies. He would take white milk jugs, cut the tops off and slip them over the heads of unsuspecting dogs, leaving them unable to see, before leaving them out on the road to be run over by passing cars. He took pride in the fact that one of the dogs he tormented in such a way was his own. The moment that one match fumbled from his hand, it burned away not only his childhood innocence, but also any shred of humanity he may have had left. As he got a little older, he was drawn to a life of crime, experimenting with petty offences before graduating to more serious acts like burglary. Despite his attempts to leave his criminal past behind, he found himself unable to escape the allure of a life of crime, his record growing more and more extensive with each passing year. But it wasn't until 1986 when he fully embraced the darkness within him and began to commit the ultimate act of evil. It was almost Christmas in 1986 and as the cold winter night settled in, Lewis sat alone in his van, his eyes scanning the streets for his prey. He clutched his hunting knife tightly, the blade hidden between the flaps of his wallet, ready for quick access. The memory of his former girlfriend, Lena Santapio, who was heavily pregnant with his child, still fresh in his mind. She had left him not long before, her parents did not like him and convinced Lena to leave him and raise the child alone. Lewis had just spent the day following Lena. He watched as she left her parents' house with her dad and tracked them to a relative's home. They went inside the house and Lewis pulled over where he waited for her to leave. But as the hours passed, she did not return. His frustration turned to anger. The holiday decorations that adorned the town only served to fuel his hatred for the festive season. As he navigated the icy roads, the weak headlights of his van struggled to illuminate the way. The snow fell heavily as he made his way to the town square. His thoughts consumed with Lena and the child he had been denied. It was there that he spotted her, or at least someone who resembled her. A young woman with the same brown hair and dark eyes as Lena, walking along the roadside. He slowed his van, his heart leaping at the possibility that it was her. But as she turned her face to him, he realized it was not. It was just another lost soul, caught in the same web of despair he was. You're looking for a ride, he said. Yeah, you're looking for a girl, she replied. She was a street worker. He pulled over, and as she climbed into the van, he pressed play on the tape deck, filling the air with holding back the years by Simply Red, the song that had once been his and Lena's song, now just a cruel reminder of what he had lost. As he drove, he sang along, his voice cold and empty, as he plotted his next move. He watched the woman, as she trembled. Her nerves were betraying her. She was simply creeped out by Lewis, but it only made him more anxious. So he quickly unheathed the knife with his right hand and pressed the blade against her neck, forcing her head down between her knees. He pinned her left hand under his thigh, making sure she wouldn't reach the gear shift. She let out a soft cry as he drove for 15 miles, finally stopping behind a gravel pit. He ordered her out of the van and they walked into the woods. She pleaded with him, but he took what he wanted from her, her screams echoing through the trees during the ordeal. When he was done, he silenced her permanently. He strangled her and then he forced himself on her remains. After this, he becomes even more demented 
he sliced open her stomach in a twisted search for his unborn child. When he could not find what he was looking for, he stabbed her another 30 or 40 times until his arm was aching. He left her there, covered in blood and dirt. He dragged some wood over her in a weak attempt to hide the body. He then walked back to the van, got in, pressed play and simply read, once again filled the air. Lewis and Lena had been dating for six months when she became pregnant and he moved in with her family soon after. But as the pregnancy progressed, things began to take a turn for the worse. Lena cut off physical intimacy and her mother constantly berated Lewis. Lena was also pregnant with twins, but one of them died in the womb and this further sent Lewis on a downward spiral. He found solace on the streets, picking up street workers and seeking a release. It was an August night in 1986, five months before his first killing, when his desperation led to a heinous act. He saw a woman sitting outside a pizza parlor where she worked and offered her a ride, but she declined. Later that evening, he passed the same place and she was still there. So he asked again, sure you don't need a ride? Maybe I do, she responded. But when she got into the van, he came out with the knife almost instantly. Don't fight me, he told the 23 year old woman. I've done this before. He drove her to a secluded, fenced in parking lot and brutally forced himself on her. After he was done, the woman fled and reported the attack to the police. Lewis was caught, but served just two months in jail. He said, I learned my lesson. Whilst in prison, he was desperate to know one thing, which had been eating him up for some time, whether the remaining twin was a boy or a girl. From prison, he would write Lena, called her via collect call because he had no money, but Lena never replied. The harassing was daily and Lena's parents were saying they would soon have to take some action. So when Lewis called next, and the operator asked if she would collect the charge. She just blurted out boy and hung up. This was to be the last time Lewis ever heard her voice. As the months passed, he couldn't shake his obsession. Lena, heavily pregnant, became the focus of his twisted desires. He lingered in the shadows, always watching, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. One night, he made his move. Her car, something he knew she cherished, was set ablaze in the dead of the night, the flames illuminating the terror on her face. As she and her family fled their home, the police may have been unable to prove his involvement, but he knew the truth, reveling in the power he held over her. He watched her from the bushes, as she and her family witnessed her beloved car go up in smoke. As the holidays came to a close, Lewis was consumed by a darkness that he couldn't shake. His thoughts were fixated on Lena and the all-consuming desire to end his own life. He found solace in the most unlikely of places, the elevator of his apartment complex. He would ride it at all hours of the night, pushing the stop button between floors. He said, I liked the way it felt. In there, it was quiet, sort of cut off from everybody else. I'd get on about three o'clock in the morning and push the stop button. I practically live there, but his obsession led him to take more extreme measures, breaking into the apartment of a woman named Caroline Sweet, where he found guns, which he stole. His mind consumed by dark desires. One of the pistols became his constant companion. He would sit for hours in the elevator with the muzzle pressed against his temple, working up the courage to pull the trigger, but he could never go through with it. He wanted someone else to do it for him. So he began to plan for the occasion. He took a rope into the elevator and rode it to the top floor. 
He climbed up through the elevator's emergency access panel and tied the rope to the support beam in the elevator shaft. He tied the other end around his neck and he sat there for hours, waiting for someone to summon the elevator and snap his neck. No one came. He did this for days on end, but eventually his plan went badly wrong. On January 19th, 1987, a young girl named Stephanie, who lived in the apartment he had robbed, opened the elevator doors to a nightmare. There, she found Lewis, with the noose already in place. He thought she knew that he had robbed her flat, and was aware of what he was trying to do to himself. The next morning, he lured Stephanie, with the promises of toys, back to the elevator, and then, with cold calculation. He strangled her to within an inch of her life. When Carolyn Sweet had realized her daughter was not with the other children, she asked them where she went. She went off with a man back inside, one of the children said. Carolyn frantically ran back inside the apartment building, shouting her name. She searched as quickly as she could. She pushed the button for the lift, and when the doors opened, there was Stephanie crumpled in the corner, in a pool of her own blood. Doctors in the emergency room said Stephanie would have died if she was strangled even just for one or two more seconds. But miraculously, she survived and was able to describe her attacker to the police. They quickly apprehended Lewis and discovered a mind consumed by obsession and a desire of death. He was deemed too mentally ill to stand trial and was committed to Bridgewater State Hospital, a mental institution where he spent four years for his heinous crime. Lewis didn't speak of the horrors he endured at Bridgewater, but he was desperate to escape. He was willing to do anything to leave. His lawyer had a simple solution, plead guilty. And so he did. The judge sentenced him to 10 years but with the possibility of parole after just four and a half years. The sentence was retroactive, meaning his time in the hospital would count towards his time served. Yeah, man, he said. I was out of there in six months. He was only 27 when he was released, and he moved back in with his mother in Atlanta. But his past haunted him, and he was quickly dismissed from his new job at a dry cleaning company. The owner suspecting him of stealing the cash registers. He couldn't escape his past, and the scars of Bridgewater were forever etched in his mind. Two months after his release from Bridgewater, the darkness of night crept over Atlanta as the predator prowled the streets once again, searching for his next victim. He craved a woman with a likeness of Lena, and on Stewart Avenue, in front of the Alamo Motel, he found her, another streetwalker. Before she got in the car, she said she had to run into her motel room real quick, something about making sure her son was okay. Once in the car though, he overpowered her and forced her down, holding her captive with one hand while the other brandished a deadly weapon. He took her to a secluded dirt pit near the Fulton County Airport where under the cloak of darkness, he savagely forced himself on her at knife point. He proceeded to stab her 30 to 40 times, again until his arm could attack no more, leaving her to die alone in the dirt, as her life faded away. But he felt something different this time. She didn't even cry or anything, he said. It was kind of strange. Three more lives were brutally taken, quickly, one after the other, with ruthless precision. The next victim was a young woman, heavily pregnant, much like my dear Lena had been when I had last laid eyes on her, he said later, during interrogation. He had been a customer of hers before, but he wanted her more this time because in his twisted mind, he wanted to try and get his child back. He took her to a secluded spot. When she got in my car, it was the strongest feeling I've ever had about one of these girls, Lewis said. I asked her, have you ever been to Massachusetts? Do you know anybody in Massachusetts, he said. 
She just seemed sort of confused about it. But how was she to know that he was embodying her as his former ex? He took her to a secluded spot in Douglas County, Georgia. I parked my car by the side of the road, and as I walked around to the passenger side, I pulled out my knife. She struggled to get out of the car. She was really pregnant, making it difficult to move. I grew impatient and grabbed her by the hair and pulled her out the car. He made her walk up a slope until they reached the top and then he made her strip. He was relishing in her vulnerability and fear. But as he looked at her, her pregnant form, it repulsed him, but he just couldn't leave her. I had to finish the job, he said. So he stabbed her again and again until her screams turned to whimpers and then silence. I covered her body with branches and drove to the gas station to clean the blood off my shoes and hands. I returned home and disposed of the knife. He then waited for the next opportunity to satisfy his twisted desires. During interrogation, he whispered to himself the tales of the Georgia women he had taken. One by one, each memory, a sickening fantasy etched into his mind. He remembered picking up the third Georgia woman near the bars and strip clubs on Fulton Industrial Boulevard. The neon lights illuminating her face as she unknowingly walked towards her death. He drove her down Fulton Industrial a couple of miles until he found the perfect secluded spot. The knife glinted in the moonlight as he took her just a few feet into the woods where he would have his way with her before ending her life again with 30 to 40 stab wounds. The fourth Georgia killing was no different. Another woman picked up in the same spot, another body left to rot in the woods. He could only recall the name of one of his victims, Angela, the second one he had killed. But the others, they were just faceless names to him now. For a short while, the murders stopped. He found a new girlfriend, Kim Davis. This occupied his desires. Unfortunately, things did not work out. Lewis was too obsessive. She didn't need someone looking over her shoulder all the time, and she ended their relationship. Of course, Lewis could not handle this, and he started to stalk her. One evening, he waited for her in a bar where she liked to go. He watched her as she came in with another man. Lewis was furious. He decided to wait for her in the parking lot, covered in the darkness. When she eventually got into her car, Lewis punched through the window and hit her very hard several times in the head. The man she was with came to her rescue and Lewis fled. The owner of the bar called the police and officers quickly located Lewis, speeding away. He was being chased by multiple patrol cars and eventually he lost control of his. With his car now stopped, police drew their guns and Lewis simply raised his hands and awaited arrest. Inside the car, officers found some sinister items including a large blade with a serrated edge, burglary kit, pliers, screwdriver, and a foot-long steel pipe wrapped in duct tape. This landed Lewis another stretch in prison of 10 years, but in less than four years, he was released. He was 32 and had again moved back in with his mother, but it wasn't long before he was back up to his old tricks. He started picking up street workers again. Lewis checked into a motel on the causeway over Mobile Bay and registered under a name chosen at random from the phone book. As the darkness descended, he began to make calls to escort services listed in the yellow pages, searching for a blonde girl to satisfy his twisted desires. Eventually, after some time, a woman called at his room. She described herself as a 5 foot 4, 100 pound brunette. He instructed her to come over, but before she arrived, Lewis set up his motel, ready for murder. He placed a rope on the floor, behind the bed, 
and a knife behind the headboard, ready to draw quickly on his unsuspecting victim. The woman who came to the door was called Misty McGuigan. Lewis gave her $150 for physical intimacy, but as they engaged in the act, she reminded him of Lena, and he snapped. You've got to get out of here, he told her, but she did not take his advice, and that turned out to be deadly. She asked him why, and put her hand on his back. He quickly jumped to his feet, turned around, and began hitting her and choking her as she pleaded for her life. He stabbed her repeatedly until she lay motionless on the bed. He then wrapped her bloodied body in plastic tarp and placed her in the back of his truck. He drove 12 miles down a lonely stretch with little traffic. Then he stopped. He dragged her body about 50 feet from the road to have physical intercourse with her corpse. Unable to resist the sick urge, he wanted to be close to her once more. He took her purse, her ponytail holder, and took the money he'd given her earlier at the motel. On his way to his mother's house, he threw out the purse along a wooded area and tossed the knife off a bridge in an attempt to cover his tracks. In the attic of his mother's house, he kept what would be his trophy room with mementos from each of his killings on a plywood altar. As Lewis descended deeper into the abyss of addiction, he indulged in the vice of streetwalkers and drowning his sorrows in drink. On a day that should have been a celebration for his son's birthday, January 16th, Lewis embarked on a self-destructive binge that would consume him for months to come. He did this every year. I wonder what could have been if he had ever known his son. Probably nothing good would have came of it, but I do wonder. Concealing his depravity from his mother, he would sneak out at night, lugging trash bags filled with empty cans and bottles. And it was not until April, when his inevitable end came in the form of his final arrest, that the true extent of his descent was finally revealed. The next thing I am going to read is a confession he wrote to one of his pen pals whilst in prison. It is about his next murder of a woman named Kathleen Bracken. It is at least based in truth, but this will very much be his version of events. Before we read it, I want to say thank you to the people at Serial Killer Central, a Facebook page who suggested this case and gave me access to this letter. If you are on Facebook, go check them out. Thank you. It happened at a place called Twilight Motel. That's been my nickname since I was caught. Twilight. This place was a dump. There was a bar in front of the rooms in the back. A lot of street walkers hung out there. You could drive around the place and the girls stood in front of the room doors if they were available. Well, that night I had no luck at all finding anyone all along that strip where the street walkers hang out. And I looked everywhere, but no one was around at that time. So I pulled in front of the bar and finished my beer before I went in. While I'm sitting there, this girl comes out. Her name is Kat. Kathleen Bracken. She looked good as hell. Nice ass, small breasts, about five foot eight but slim. Long brown hair, but she had a big nose. But I'm pretty drunk and I just wanna get laid. I'm not really thinking about killing. I just want some action. So she sees me and comes out and asks me why I'm just sitting out here in the parking lot. I told her I was going in as soon as I finished my beer and that I was looking for a girl. She said, well, you found one, come back to my room. So I get out and we go back to her room and then she's like, it'll be a hundred bucks. I had the money, but I ain't paying this one a hundred bucks. She wasn't that good looking. I figured I could find something else and she got mad and started cursing me. So I left, I rode around and still there were no girls. I go back to Kat's room. There's a fat girl outside her room and I asked if Kat was in there and she said yeah, but she's busy. She asked if she could sit in my truck and wait, so I let her. I thought about taking her, but decided just to wait, to see if I could talk Kat into going down to 
If not, I'd have the fat girl. She told me all the other girls were downtown because of the Easter weekend and all the shrimp boats were in. I wasn't going downtown mobile because there were cops all over that place and they have cameras on poles all along the street. So this fat girl is real quiet and I'm kind of looking over at her and she just turned me off. Ugly and she smelled funny too. So I decided if I can't get Kat down to 50, I'll go to Solomon's. It's a gay bar. Besides, I could get laid there for free. After a while, some guy comes out of Kat's room and Kat stands in the doorway, butt naked. She looked real good in clothes, but naked, she looked old and worn out. She sees me and asks me if I changed my mind. And she tells the fat chick that I'm the one she was telling her about how she cussed me out. So we all go into the room and close the door because there's guys in the parking lot yelling at her because she's naked. Kat doesn't even cover up. Her and the fat girl talk about getting something to eat and she leaves. I tried to talk Kat down, but she wouldn't do it. So I turn to leave and this bee hits me in the back of my head, then kicks me and starts slapping on me. So I turn around and push her off me and the bee bit my finger. So with my other hand, I grab her neck and squeeze her Adam's apple. I felt it crunch as my fingers pulled it to the side of her neck. She lets go of my finger and I put that hand on her neck too and choke her out and throw her on the bed. My finger hurts like hell, but it's not bleeding. She starts to wake up a little bit. So I get on the bed and straddle her and punch her in the face real hard. It knocked her out. I'm looking down at her naked body under me. I'm hard, so I say F it. There's a rubber on the nightstand. I get it and spread her legs apart with my knees and put the rubber on. Her lips are open. I can see pink and I ain't even touched her yet. So I stick myself in her and it goes in real easy. I start to F her and she starts to move around a little bit. She's coming too. So I start choking her with both hands. I'm leaning up on my arms and the full weight of my body is against her neck as I F her. Her hands try to grab mine and pull them away. The whole time her eyes are open and she's looking at me as I choke her and F her. It didn't take long because I was pretty turned on. I get off her and she's out, but her eyes are still open. So I pull the rubber off and look for something to put it in because I'm gonna take that with me. And there on the floor is a crumpled up $100 bill and a plastic bag with a six pack of bud in it. I guess the money was from the other guy and I'm thinking that sucker gave this bee a hundred dollars. So I pocket the money and put the rubber in with the beer. Then I look at her lying there on the bed, naked, with her legs spread wide open and her eyes looking up. I grabbed her legs to close them and she still felt warm. So I was like the hell with it. I've come this far. So I pulled out my pocket knife and put my ear against her chest. I can hear her heart beating slow. So I put the knife over her heart as I keep one ear against her and push the knife in her chest. There's hardly any blood because I hear that it all goes into the chest cavity. So I move the knife around with the blade inside of her. I pull it out and stab her again and again, each time moving the handle around. Then I heard one loud heartbeat and then it got even slower. So I listen as I move the knife around and her heart beat about 10 times more, each time getting slower in between. And then it stopped. I looked at her face and her eyes are still open. So I pull the knife out and wipe it against her side to get the blood off. First one side and then the other. And it cut her skin, but it didn't bleed. So I sat on the edge of the bed and I just dragged the knife against her skin, leaving cuts that didn't bleed. A few filled with a little blood, but not enough for it to flow. Just a little. I cut her face, her neck, chest, breasts, stomach and legs. Then I remembered the fat chick that left to get some food. I'd forgotten about her, so I started to roll Kat's body in a sheet. My truck was right outside the door, so I was going to throw her in the back. But I look out the window 
and there's a few people sitting there on their car hoods drinking so I don't know when the fat girl is coming back so I grab the bag with the beer and the rubber and leave I made sure I had wiped everything I touched I left behind a cigarette butt they got the DNA off that later when I was cutting her skin it wasn't going deep I didn't put much pressure against the blade the cuts only opened about a quarter of an inch if that but anyway I left went down the road and that's when I picked up Lisa the little blonde looking back now there's a lot of things I should have done different that night and the next day later on during discovery motions in court for this murder I found out that the fat girl had come back to the room she had a key she found Kat's body and freaked out but never called the cops because she had a bunch of warrants on her from Texas she got 25 years but the next day she told someone else and they called the cops but looking back I should have effed Lisa brought her back afterwards that night and tried to get Kat's body out of the room or just killed Lisa in the woods like I wanted to but like I told you she was good real good and I felt weak and let her go but I really wanted to F her some more I made a lot of stupid mistakes then hell I went 12 years without a single mistake I really should have known better but I can't go back now with the blood of his last victim still fresh on his hands Lewis set out in search of someone else's life to end he found her at the Crest Motel her name was Lisa he took her to his mother's house where he enticed her with the promise of substances and he indulged in his twisted desires but as they lay in bed the memory of the previous night's kill still lingered in his mind he couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched and the thought of not disposing of the body properly like he had done with the others was eating away at him he knew that the police were probably closing in on him and the red truck he drove would easily give him away but as Easter morning dawned he couldn't resist the urge to claim another victim he took Lisa to a secluded dirt road where he intended to take her life but as he stood there knife in hand he said she had sort of lightish brown blonde hair it just wasn't doing much for me so I let her go he let her go most likely because he felt bad that he might soon get caught he knew he had messed the last murder up sure enough the police were closing in on him they soon questioned Lisa who told them she was with a guy who had a red truck and told them where he lived and it was only a matter of time before they knocked on his mother's door and when they did he confessed to his heinous crimes quickly he relished in the opportunity to boast about the two dead women in Georgia Misty McGuigan and Kathleen Bracken as well as the others who he couldn't even remember the name of whose lives he had taken without a second thought he was soon in prison whilst in there the stench of death and decay clung to Lewis both physically and mentally his unkempt appearance reeked of neglect and apathy and his skin pale and bloated his once striking green eyes were now sunken deep into their sockets he had truly given up on life he said I want to go to court and lose I don't want to spend the rest of my life in here I want to die I thought about killing myself but I just can't do it Gerald Patrick Lewis a cold-blooded killer when brought before the court unashamedly pleaded guilty to a litany of heinous crimes including malice murder felony murder aggravated battery kidnapping with bodily injury and even the murder of an unborn child though he was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole for the merciless slaying of Kathleen Bracken the jury saw it fit to impose the ultimate punishment and sentenced Lewis to death for the brutal murder of Misty McGuinn in 2003 it was also revealed during the trial that Lewis had confessed to taking the lives of not just these two women but also Peggy Grimes and other unnamed streetwalkers in Georgia Lewis spent his final days rotting away on death row before finally succumbing to his fate 
on July 25th, 2009, when he died suddenly. That's all we got time for in this episode. Until next time, stay sane. On, on a fateful evening in April 2005, Gregory Desprez approached the United States-Canada border crossing, armed with a collection of deadly weapons, including a homemade saw, a hatchet, a knife, brass knuckles, and a chainsaw, stained with the evidence of his gruesome crimes. Unknowing US custom agents allowed him entry into the country, unaware of the horror that awaited to be discovered in Desperay's hometown of Minto, New Brunswick. The mutilated bodies of Frederick Fulton and Veronica Dakari, who were Desperay's neighbors, were discovered the next day. With a history of violence, Desperay was the prime suspect in their brutal murders. Before we start, if you find this video fascinating, then at the end, please drop it a like and let me know what you thought about the case. It helps the channel. Also, don't forget to hit subscribe for more. Thank you. As a young boy, Gregory Allen Desprey seemed to have it all. He was outgoing and popular, participating in various community activities and even holding down a couple of part-time jobs. His parents, Jenny Desprey and Glendon Myers, separated when he was young and Desprey and his mother moved to Massachusetts. But something sinister lurked within him, waiting to be unleashed. As he entered his teenage years, his mother noticed a disturbing change in his personality, but she brushed it off as just a phase. Teenage years can be extremely challenging, especially for a 16-year-old boy who is estranged from his father. It wasn't until Gregory cut all ties with his mother and went back to his hometown of Minto to live with his father that the full extent of his descent into darkness was revealed. For two long years, Jenny had no contact with her son until she made the decision to return to Minto herself. What she found was a shell of the boy she once knew. Gregory had become a hermit, rarely leaving his residence, and neighbors reported seeing him outside only occasionally. When Jenny asked her son if he was using substances, he strongly denied it. But it became clear that his mental state was rapidly deteriorating. Desprey's story is a chilling reminder of the destructive power of mental illness and the importance of seeking help, if possible, before it's too late. The news of Fred Fulton and Veronica Dacquery's passing came as a shock to the entire community. The elderly couple had been fixtures in Minto for many years and were loved by all who knew them. Fred was known for his talent at playing the guitar, especially country music, and was known for being a kind and gentle soul. Verna, though more reserved, was beloved for her warm heart and willingness to lend a helping hand to anyone in need. They lived just a stone's throw away from the house of Desprey's father. On that fateful evening, on April 23rd, 2005, Gregory Desprey set out with deadly intent. Armed with a variety of lethal weapons, he made his way to the home of Fred Fulton, age 74, and Veronica Dacquery, aged 70. With savage determination, Desprey cut through a screen door and kicked in the second door, determined to reach his targets. Once inside, he made his way straight to the bedroom where he viciously stabbed Veronica Dacquery 
a staggering 30 times, causing her death by massive blood loss. As he witnessed the brutal murder of his wife, Fred Fulton attempted to flee, but was chased down by Desprey. Fulton had wounds on his hands, indicating he grabbed at the murder weapon and tried to fend off the killer. He also had injuries on his feet, suggesting he kicked at the killer. The elderly man put up a fight, but ultimately he was no match for the raging killer. Desprey stabbed him 31 times, and then, in a grotesque act of brutality, he decapitated him. Although there were 31 wounds on Fulton's body, including deep injuries to his chest, a coroner told the court he believes the cause of death was sharp forced trauma to the neck with decapitation. On the balance of probabilities, the injuries to the chest would not have been immediately lethal, he said. The head of Mr. Fulton was discovered in a pillowcase under the kitchen table. Police found a dagger on the floor of the couple's home after the murder, but the murder weapon used in this heinous crime was never identified, as Desprey had a collection of various dangerous weapons, including a chainsaw, knife, brass knuckles, and a homemade hatchet. The chilling details of this murder have left a lasting impact, reminding us of the depravity of which some individuals are capable of. Gregory Desprey is a cold-blooded killer who brutally murdered Fred Fulton and Verna Dacquery, leaving a trail of blood in his wake. Upon arriving at the United States border, he brazenly claimed to be a hired assassin from the US government, boasting of having murdered over 700 people. Edward Young told the court he was heading to the United States with friends for a vacation on April 25th, 2005, when he was detained at the border crossing. Whilst he was there, he spoke briefly to Desprey, who had also been stopped by border guards. He said Desprey described himself as an assassin, and he said Desprey told him he had just finished a job in Canada and was on his way home. Unbelievably, the border patrol let him through, and he went on his way, leaving the two bodies to be discovered the following day. Bill Anthony, a spokesman for the US Customs and Border Protection, said the Canada-born Desprey could not be detained because he is a naturalized US citizen and was not wanted on any criminal charges at the time. Desprey was questioned for two hours before being released and during this time, Customs agents tried every conceivable method to check for warrants to see if Desprey had broken any laws in trying to re-enter the country. Anthony continued, nobody asked to detain him. Being bizarre is not a reason to keep somebody out of this country or lock them up. We are governed by laws and regulations and he did not violate any of them. Anthony conceded, it sounds stupid that a man wielding what appeared to be a bloody chainsaw could not be detained, but our people don't have a crime lab up there. They can't look at a chainsaw and decide if it's blood, rust or red paint. The same day that the spray crossed the border, he was due in a Canadian court to be sentenced on charges. He assaulted and threatened to kill Fulton's son-in-law, Frederick Mowat. Mowat told the police that Desprey had been bothering his father-in-law for the past month, and when Mowat confronted him, Desprey pulled out a knife and pointed it at Mowat's chest and said he was going to get you all. Two days after committing the heinous act, the victim's daughter made the gruesome discovery, finding her father's lifeless body. Desprey had fled the scene in Fulton's car 
later dumping the vehicle at a gravel pit on a highway leading towards the border. But his escape was short-lived. On April 27th, police spotted Desprey hitchhiking down a highway. His sweatshirt was stained with the telltale signs of the crime, red and brown stains. Desprey was apprehended and detained, facing the consequences of his actions as he was extradited back to Canada. The brutality of the murder sent shockwaves through the community. There needed to be two trials, as Desprey was deemed unfit to stand trial the first time around, with a doctor deeming him to have a paranoid schizophrenia. On March 5th, 2008, Gregory Desprey was found guilty by Justice William Grant for causing the deaths of Fred Fulton and Verna Deckery. Despite this verdict, the defence argued that Desprey was not criminally responsible for his actions at the time of the crime due to a mental disorder. As a result, he was not sentenced to prison, but instead was placed under the care of mental health professionals at the Shepherdy Healing Centre, which is part of the Dorchester Penitentiary. To date, Desprey has not acknowledged his involvement in the deaths or accepted responsibility for his actions. That's all we got time for in this episode. Until next time, stay sane. The events that took place on January 30th, 2016, would forever haunt the lives of India Chip Chase's family and friends forever. The 20-year-old barmaid living in Northampton, UK, had plans to become a paramedic. She was out with friends on a night out. She was seen visibly upset about her on-off relationship with her boyfriend. She was trying to contact him, but could not get through. Just after 1am, she is approached by an older, balding man, wearing a thick jacket and a rucksack. He was overheard saying, Don't worry, I'll make sure you get home safely. She was never seen alive again. Before we start, if you find this video fascinating, then at the end, please drop it a like and let me know what you thought about the case. It helps the channel. And also, don't forget to hit subscribe for more. Thank you. It was safe to say that India was heavily intoxicated at the Club MB. Her friends described her as very drunk and steaming. One friend said, India was quite drunk, a lot more than me. She was walking wonky. She was very, very drunk. She was also seen crying and attempting to contact her boyfriend. She was emotionally distressed. India's friend commented, she just told me that they weren't speaking anymore and she was upset about it. Only a short time later, despite her friends searching for her, they were unable to locate India. I had my back to her and when I turned around, she wasn't stood there. Her friends assumed she had gone home or met up with other friends. What actually happened was, barman Dave Burry had hailed a cab for her after she told him, I want to go home, I want to go home. The bouncer helped India into a taxi, but she became agitated when she was asked to pay the fare in advance, and she exited the vehicle and went back to lean against the nightclub's wall. India was still trying to contact her boyfriend. At 1.11 a.m., Edward Tenniswood arrived at MB's nightclub with CCTV showing him turning to look at India, who was standing alone using her phone before approaching her moments later. Tenniswood is seen leaning over her, putting his arm around her in chilling footage. A witness overheard him say, We'll make sure you get home in a taxi safely. Edward Tenniswood was described by his landlord as a friendless loner, and even his lawyer said he was an oddball. He told the taxi driver 
to drop them off a little further away than necessary from his house, in some poor attempt to conceal his identity. A witness reported seeing a drunken woman, who resembled India, being escorted into a house by an older man. The sighting occurred on the street where Edward Tenniswood lived in Northampton. The witness stated that the woman appeared to be heavily intoxicated and was holding onto the railings, and the man was leading her by the arm and guiding her into the house. Edward Tenniswood, who was a bookkeeper, lived alone in a rented flat. He had his furniture shrouded in plastic sheets and newspapers scattered across the floors. His computer was wrapped too. Everything was wrapped in cling film, giving the impression of a chilling, isolated home. Tenniswood explained, it seems illogical to keep cleaning it to use it. Instead, you just replace the cling film rather than the rigmarole of cleaning. His neighbor described how there was no curtains or carpet on the floor. He said, it's a messy house. There is grease everywhere. Tennis would cut out clippings of women and had placed them around the flat, including the pop band Little Mix, and most chillingly, Heather Stewart White, who, if you look at side by side, bears a striking resemblance to India. He later said in court, showing his delusional side, that he was in a relationship with Heather. He said, I had some extremely attractive girlfriends. Is that a crime? He told the court he dated the model in the late 80s, bordering into the 90s. I've got photos with her lipstick on for goodness sake. I wouldn't make something like that up. Asked about the four pictures he kept as ornaments in his kitchen. He said, they remind me of ex-girlfriends. Miss Stuart White replied to his claims saying, I have never heard of him. I don't know him. Do you know how many times, especially when I was modeling, people said they knew me? Tenniswood took India to his bedroom where he forced himself on her before beating her and strangling her. His actions were abhorrent and inexcusable. The fact that India's body was found with over 30 injuries and that Tenniswood's blood was underneath her fingernails shows evidence of a struggle suggesting that she fought for her life before being killed. This only adds to the tragedy of the situation. This was all by 3 a.m., the first hour she was in his house. Chillingly, in court, Tenniswood had a very distorted view of what happened. He talked of how he hugged his India, like we were posing for a selfie, after claiming she kissed him first after he tried to stop her falling over. He said, I was taken aback because it was unexpected, also because it was a full on kiss, a French kiss. Tenniswood claimed the moment was an incredibly moving thing. As he described, he and India were embracing and looking at their reflections together in an upstairs mirror. Tenniswood said, she made this incredibly moving comment which at the time was very sweet. It was a very India thing to do. I can only imagine how India's family felt in court, listening to him say this. I feel angry thinking about it. He continued, we had a loving physical intimacy, in which during he had squeezed her throat with his hands briefly, gripping his own throat in court. He described what happened. She moved her hands down to mine and put my hands on her neck again. As I did, she applied pressure and then I continued to apply pressure. As I did, she took her hands off and put her one hand above her and her left hand down to her side. I just continued to apply the pressure. And then, at this moment, in the court, tennis would paused for five minutes with his head in his hands. He then said, what was different to before was she closed her eyes as I continued to apply pressure and moved her hands off my hands. I was applying pressure for between five and 10 seconds. Her body spasmed and she let out an extraordinary exhale. She then fell asleep. 
he told the court. I was so fatigued, I effectively blacked out. When we woke up, sorry, when I woke up, it was early evening. I just assumed she was in a deep sleep. I lit a cigarette. To my shame, the first thing I did was pour myself a drink of wine. I became aware she wasn't snoring. I went over and looked at her, and she didn't seem right. Panic set in. Tennis Wood's chilling words echoed through the courtroom as he spoke of his belief that India may have suffered a stroke or fallen into a coma. Despite not knowing how to check her pulse, he coldly dressed her body and covered her with fresh sheets before leaving to satisfy his hunger with a kebab. He added, I was convinced she would gain consciousness while I was out. In a further sign of his disturbed nature, he said, I wish I had left a note that said, India darling, I will be back in 20 minutes. Love, Eddie. Even though Tenniswood was a creep, he somehow had no previous criminal record. He was, however, unbeknown to him, already under investigation. The women, who cannot be named, said he was a controlling man, violent and abusive when drunk. One woman claimed she woke up and found tennis wood on top of her on several occasions. The woman called the police on one occasion and tennis wood was arrested for a fray, but she did not press charges and he was released. Another victim told the court that tennis wood throttled and kissed her when she was a teenager and said he also pinned her down and held her at knife point. On another occasion, she was at a barbecue and Tennis Wood was in drink and he became angry, chased her and pinned her down, but she managed to kick him and get away. So this was not a one-off. Tennis Wood has been a threat to women for some time. India's boyfriend, Grant Hare, returned home Although he did have his phone on him during the evening, the loud music meant he did not hear it and it ran out of battery during the night. He charged his phone once home and immediately made three calls to India, but these rang out and went to answer phone. Prosecutors say by this time she would already have been murdered by Tennis Wood. That morning, the Chip Chase family grew increasingly concerned that they were unable to contact their daughter. Their worries intensified when she didn't show up for her 4pm shift. They then reported her missing to the police. Her mother, Suzanne Poitner, posted a message on Facebook. India Eve Chip Chase, please let me know you're okay please darling. Love you. Meanwhile, Tennis Wood had put India's clothing back on and covered her body with a plastic sheet. He had the audacity to complain. He said, it's a traumatic experience when dressing a body. He had to go out for a kebab to clear his head. The harrowing body cam footage of the moment officers found India's lifeless body was shown in court. The Northampton police broke down the door of Tennis Wood's home on the afternoon of January 31st, two days after India was reported missing. Giving evidence, the officer said, the door was breached and we ran in, shouting police, police. I went straight upstairs to the landing, right and then right again, into the front bedroom. As I got to the doorway, I could see a mattress in front of me with a blanket on top of it and items around the edge of the room. PC Knight said he initially mistook India's hair for fur when he discovered her body lying on the mattress. He said, as I got closer, I could see her hair was displayed. Instead of being down, it was pulled up and around, sort of like a halo. I took the left-hand side corner of the blanket and pulled it over so I could see her face. The footage then shows Knight leaning over India and shouting, One casualty, can you get a paramedic? He then turns to India, Sweetheart, sweetheart, can you wake up? Hello, sweetheart? She's gone, she's gone. Off screen, 
a female officer can be heard saying, she's gone, oh no, she's gone. Instead of raising the alarm, Tennis Woods spent the next 22 hours drinking lager in an Ibis hotel, checking out news websites about the search for India. This is him entering the hotel. Police arrested him from the hotel. When they arrived, he told them, I'm surprised you were here so quick. It didn't take you long. I suppose you've been to the house and you've found what you were looking for. This is him being escorted out of the hotel by police. Following sentencing, Detective Chief Inspector Steve Walliter called Tennis Wood the worst kind of predator. In court, Tennis Wood claimed that he and India had consensual intimacy and that her death was accidental. He told the court that he'd bonded with the 20 year old in the street outside the club because both of them had been refused entry. He said she'd willingly gone back to his flat. He was charged with the essay and murder of India. Prosecutor Chris Donnellan told jurors at Birmingham Crown Court to not believe a word this defendant says. After telling them, he showed no sorrow or regret for what he had done to India Chip Chase. Not one word of it, not one word of it was an accident. He knew she was dead. He knew he had killed her. He had tidied up and pulled a sheet over her body and her phone was in a box under the stairs. This was something he must have done. All you have heard from this defendant is his own self-pity. The worst of it came when he said it was very traumatic dressing a body, a dead body. Because that's what it was, India's dead body. Mr. Tenniswood has said he was over eager to satisfy Miss Chip Chase and that she had guided his hands to her neck. However, he never raised the alarm after her death and spent 22 hours boozing in a hotel before the police arrested him. Mr. Donnellan added, Tenniswood described the trauma to himself, not the awful trauma to India whose life had been squeezed out of her by him. Far from getting help, he was only full of his own self-pity. He expressed no sorrow for killing her, but only talked about his own panic, own predicament once he had killed her. The pathologist found that India died from pressure on the neck. He applied that pressure. He did until she died, but he even tried to shift the blame onto her saying she guided him with her hands. The trauma for him is that she inconveniently died. He used the phrase typical India. What a peculiar phrase. What a delusional phrase. He met the girl at 1 a.m. blind drunk. How does he know what typical India is? But the phrase is a disturbing one. It tells a disturbing story. He has in that remarkably short time decided in his mind he has some sort of relationship with her but he did not say a word of this in interview either way he has discarded her and left her to die the jury also didn't believe him they took just one hour and 45 minutes to return a unanimous guilty verdict the judge mr justice saunders described it as a crime of utter depravity Tenniswood was jailed for life and will serve a minimum of 30 years. That's all we got time for in this episode. Until next time, stay sane.